Thankfully, and uh, morning and uh, all the uh, it's a bit of a shocking news for us at the moment, I tell you. Um, because as um, young as he was, and uh, only uh, three weeks ago, he was ordaining the minister. And so, you know, all that, you know, when we know uh, he passed away, it is um, really shocking. So, we will pray for him um, and for his family um, during our service later. Um, here we are with. Um, all sorts of feelings and thoughts in our minds, but one thing for sure, we are here uh, to give our thanks and praise to our Maker and our Finder, our loving God, whose love is constant for us and His presence is eternal in our world. So here we are to give our worship to God who is with us and for us always. So let us focus our minds for a moment and uh, begin to offer our wish. Join in our first in Jesus is the Lord of creation, twice proclaims it. to be able to call you and 
as our Father and to be able to feel that we are part of your family. And that loving God, you have given us your Son, Jesus Christ, as our leader, as our Lord, as our Savior, as our brother. We thank you, Father, for the life and time of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for his death and resurrection, for all the things that he has done on our behalf and for our sake. We want to thank you and praise you. We thank you, Father, for the faith that you have instilled in our hearts and minds in and through your Son. Oftentimes we wonder how our lives would be without the faith that we have in you. We are here to give you our thanks for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit in our lives your Holy Spirit in our church, your Holy communities and in our world. We come here, loving God, with your understanding and awareness of your faithfulness. Everything around us is changing, but you come to us as a changeless God with the same offer of love, grace and forgiveness for your loving kindness, your goodness and mercies, we give you our thanks and praise. When we come to worship you, loving God, we come with an awareness of our limitations, of our shortcomings. Our words and our thoughts are limited, loving God, to express how we love you, how much we adore you, but this is a time that we offer to you, loving God, in true honesty and love and pray that you will make this time such a blessing for each one of us. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we hear from the gospel. The reading is taken from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and it starts at verse 14. John the Baptist is beheaded. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, who I am beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. 
Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and ministry commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought him his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Thanks be to God for his word. We thank God for his words for us this morning and thank you to Ruth for reading those words for us. Let us pray. Father most holy, we give you thanks for your words for us this morning. Your words always giving us meaning and purpose for our lives. Now as we hear your words and share them, Father God, we pray that you will speak to us, speaking to us in your spirit, Father, so that our understanding of you will be broadened and our faith deepened. Speak to us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's a big day for all of us, particularly for sports fan, one big match after the other to watch and we are going to be occupied for the whole of this day, uh, glued to the television. It is a special day for us as well when we hear this passage from Mark's Gospel. Those of us who have been following Bible Month and the discussions um, at house groups and uh, our Bible study circles um, would have gone through the whole of uh, Mark, and um, come to appreciate how clever, how well Mark has written his gospel, the shortest gospel of all, but packing so many things um, in that short gospel, all to do with Jesus Christ and uh, uh, trying to portray that Jesus Christ is the king of the earth, and he is the king of heaven. And this particular passage is one of the most cleverest pieces that we can come across that we find if we analyze that as a storytelling technique. This is one story within another story and within that another story. Very, very tightly packed um, passage that we have just heard in the context of Jesus Christ and his story, Mark now brings us to Herod, the king of the time. And Herod was just recalling about Jesus Christ. Now he heard a lot about Jesus Christ and he was surmising, he was just thinking within himself that he might be John the Baptist, now coming back alive. And then his conscience, is now telling him about how he killed John the Baptist, the third point in that story telling. One of the things that um, this Bible month has taught us or made us to appreciate more is to read our Bibles um, with um, prayer. Um, if you have seen uh, the first two uh, parts of the Bible month materials, 
it's clearly inviting us to read not um, the passages, focus passage, not once, not twice, more often during that one hour period. You read and read and read by different people. So when you hear that from uh, different people reading it, um, you try, you will get different perspectives. Do you sometimes get um, things that you have missed? They were very, very helpful. And then you pray in between, and then you discuss with one another what you have picked up from that passage and so on. And on one occasion during this um, Bible month, we were invited to meditate on that passage because sometimes Bible stories are too familiar for us, too familiar, so that it goes, it skips our attention. We don't focus very much on those words, but we, if we focus and meditate on those words, God will speak to us, give us new meaning and understanding. In this passage also, we can discern so many things about Christ, about ourselves, about the truth that God wants us to listen to and learn about. I remember as a little boy, perhaps one of the few films I have seen, the story of Herod and the dance that Salome um, Herodias' daughter was doing, little boy watching it. And um, it's the story of Jesus Christ. And um, one of my older cousins and his wife took me to this film and um, I was very reluctant to go because it was a late night show. I went instead and there were fighting scenes and um, swords and the cavalry man, um, men were fighting. And I almost screamed watching that. And they were cuddling me and said, this is only a film, just watch it. And then I remembered the dance scene. Um, Salome dancing and then um, asking for the head of John the Baptist. That memory is still very clear in my mind. Most of us will have that kind of image. We have heard this passage again and again, and we know the story of how John the Baptist died. But within that, so many things easily escape our attention. There are so many important things we find from this passage. First of all, there is a parallel, isn't it? Between John the Baptist's death and the death of Jesus Christ, because um, like um, Pilate, Herod had the opportunity to spare the life of John the Baptist because both of them knew they were innocent. They were not really worthy of being killed. And then the disciples, the disciples coming and receiving the body of John the Baptist, and this is what happened for Jesus Christ as well. There are so many parallels we can pick up from this passage, but one important thing for us is about Herod. He was there only to please the people, although he knew consciously that Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Um, John the Baptist didn't do anything wrong. He, in fact, had high regard for him. But now he is in front of all these dignitaries and that he made a promise to his stepdaughter that whatever she asked, he, he would give. And when she asked for the head of John the Baptist, there was no way for him but to honor his words. So truth is now sold for the sake of someone's honor. And that is something that we need to take to our hearts and minds, how much we take the words of God to our hearts. Sometimes I personally, as a minister, 
worry too much about not being able to preach the word as it is. Sometimes you have to mollify that. Sometimes you have to make it much palatable. The word of God is very, very strong sometimes. Even John the Baptist, if you can remember his words, in the beginning when he was calling the people for repentance, he was not speaking in beautiful language, rosy language. It was all harsh and very straightforward language. Brood of vipers, he used the term. How can you invite people using those words, brood of vipers? And that is what he was using there. No mixing or mincing words. It's straightforward language. And here we see Herod trying to please, save his face in front of the people, but selling the truth in the end. And this should bring to home to us so many things that we are confronting in our present days. The world around us is putting so much pressure on everybody. Sometimes we have to mollify our own personal take on the gospel message in order not to be seen so harsh and rough in the society. But the word of God cannot be compromised. It is as it is. I started by saying that sometimes I feel sorry. Why? When you go for training, many, many years ago, when you go for training, there was one way of theology that is given to you, very strong Methodist-oriented theology. And there is no compromise. If you are seen preaching in your own terms, compromising the Methodist doctrines, immediately the chair, the superintendent will call you. And if you cannot give an explanation, it will be reported to the chair of the district. And the chair of the district will give you a word. And if you don't listen, if you don't do the right thing, then you are dismissed. You are likely to be dismissed. So the word had to be preached as it is. Then came a time of liberal theology, very popular form of theology. This can be that, and that can be this as well. And in that I found over the years, it has been very much compromised. The word of God is compromised in order to please the general popular thoughts of the people. And recently at Bracknell church leaders meeting, I confessed, I gave my testimony. And that I mentioned about one particular service I took in Cardiff in which church. And um, I was well prepared for the service. And I was very much on um, the message. I was trying to deliver the message. But then something came into my mind. I had to change what I had to, I wanted to say. And one of the members in the congregation, an evangelical person, he came and said, you disappointed me. You disappointed me, he said. You took me in a way um, making me to expect something big and great, then suddenly you bit your tongue and changed what you wanted to say. And it was true, he was right. He was right. I felt really, really sorry um, for having done that because you can't actually change what the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to or urging you to say in worship. You have to say that. And this man noticed that. And it is all about the majority of the congregation whose view was very, very conservative and they were not giving room for this young evangelical group within the church, any space for them to grow and to express themselves. I can't remember what I exactly wanted to say, but definitely I remember I twisted, I just tweaked my message 
in order not to offend the larger part of the congregation. Truth cannot be compromised. And that is something that we learn from this passage. John was not compromising the word of Christ, although he was seen as an eccentric. The message was pure and it had great effect on the people and people respected him for that. Everybody thought he was a prophet. Even Herod accepted that he was a righteous man. But then in Herod we see someone who was trying to please the people, the crowd pleasing and God pleasing approach is what we are seeing. Sometimes we also find in our personal reflections, personal reading of the gospels or the Bible, sometimes we tend to take a gentle view of things. We don't go deeper and deeper into the truth. Sometimes that truth will upset us. Sometimes it will unsettle us. That is the nature of God's word. As much as there is comfort, as much as there is peace and calm for us, there is so much for us to be upset and unsettled about in God's words. One of the things that I always say about God's word, and when we come across words that are very familiar to us. Of course, it is human nature to skip over certain things that we are familiar with. Psalm 23, for example, next week, Pauline's going to share her thoughts on Psalm 23, and we are going to have a discussion on that. Psalm 23 is familiar to us very, very well from our childhood. We know word by word. But how many times we have meditated on those words, those great words. I remember when I was um, a student um, at Bangor University, um, that was a time I was seriously reading the Bible. One of the reasons why I had to go to Bangor is that my Bible knowledge was almost non-existent. I did Acts of the Apostles and Luke's Gospel for my O-level uh, religious studies, and that's all. And then at family um, prayer time, um, I was not with the family for most of the time because I was in boarding school or I was working away from home. So whenever I was at home, then uh, I would read the Bible, not seriously reading the Bible. When I felt the call for the ministry, the thing that came, the very first thing that came um, as a blow to me was that my Bible knowledge. I don't know much about the Bible. So I wanted to study. I wanted to um, do theology. That's why I went to Bangor. And there, reading the Bible seriously, the first take on the Bible was that I was just reading from the book, the Bible. Those words were printed on a page like, second time round, yes, there are so many truths that we can learn. Third time round, and particularly when it comes to Psalms, it became very, very different. Oh, there is something that I have not understood in all these years now becoming a reality. And then the fourth time round, fifth time around, they appear to me as not David's psalm or not someone else's song. It is my own psalm. It is my own experience. So they came very, very personal. The more we read the word of God, the more we pray about those words, they become real to us. They become God's word to us immediately. And they make a great sense of sense and deal for us and verse the, this particular verse in the psalm this is about um, you prepare a table before my enemies in from some translations it is you prepare a banquet before my enemies and i used to wonder what meaning does it give to me 
there is no personal enemies to me. I never had anyone who was angry with me or who was working against me or I was working against. No personal enemies. So I meditated on that. I thought about that again and again. Then suddenly it dawned on me. Enemies are not people there for me. It is circumstances, situations that I confronted, the difficult situations and experiences, they are the enemies. And despite all those difficulties, you can imagine how difficult it is to come to a new country without your own family. You just come as an individual and then go straight to university in a strange situation, you are given so many responsibilities. You have to do your degree, you have to train for your local preaching, and then you have to prepare for ministerial candidature all at the same time, tough time, difficult time. In those situations, the words from Psalm, and particularly you prepare a banquet before my enemies became so clear to me enemies are not people there it is the circumstances it is the situation that are not helpful to me what i felt insurmountable at the time but later god making it all easy and plain sailing and surmountable and that's how we found meaning and purpose through words of god in the bible we read and read and read and pray about it. God's spirit will tell us the truth. This is what I mean. This is what I want you to understand. Compromising the word of God. That is something that we find in this passage. One wanted to please the people, knowing the truth very well in his heart that John the Baptist wasn't worthy of being killed. He was a righteous man, good man, but he pleased, he wanted to please um, his people, his family. And then the words of John the Baptist, what Mark tries to tell us, that he was a righteous man. Jesus himself honored with his words. There wasn't anyone who was born who was as great as John the Baptist. So we want to thank God this morning for these words, very familiar story, but through that story, within that story, we find so many significant truths. And one of them is that the word of God cannot be compromised. It should be taken as it is, and it should be shared as it is. We are not here to please people. We are here to please God and God alone. Amen. Thanks be to God. We join in our next hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us.
Father most holy, we give you our thanks for this time together and to be able to sing our praises to you and to hear your words and share them. And pray that you will continue to strengthen each one of us, loving God, by your words. And that in response to your words, we pray that you will help us in your spirit so that we can stand firm in what we believe without any compromise. We stand no matter what the world around us is thinking about us. We will rely on your words and its truth only. Father, we want to pray specially this morning for Delvin's family father. We give you thanks for his life. With our memories, Father, we uh, praise you for all your goodness and mercies towards him. And that shortly before his death, he has come to realize all his preparation for his ministry in response to your calling to him, Father, as he was ordained at the conference. We can only imagine how devastating and how painful this is for all his close friends and family members. So we hold all of them in your presence, Father, asking you to be with them at this time of great shock and loss and grief. Comfort them continuously, Father, with your peace and presence in their hearts and minds. And particularly for the family, we pray that you will give them the assurance that Delvin is finding eternal rest in you, that they can cast every care on you and see the days ahead of them with the knowledge and understanding that you are with them and for them in this time of need. We want to pray for our own individual needs, loving God. We know that you know our hearts and its desires far better than we do. So Father, we pray that you will grant to us according to your will. We pray for our families and our friends and everyone who is near and dear to us in these difficult days father we pray that you will protect us all from the harms of this virus and that you continue to give your grace to each one of us praying specially for the younger members of our families those who are growing up father we pray that you will bless them in such a way that they will grow up with the awareness and understanding of your love and your goodness that is there for them always. We pray for our country and for all the difficult decisions that the leaders of this nation have to make. Father, we pray that you will continue to guide them and govern them in your wisdom and help them in your spirit so that they can make the right decisions that is beneficial for all. And we pray for our world. And especially, Father, those countries who are still struggling with the aftermath and the current situation of the pandemic. Poor countries who are struggling to get the medicines that are needed for them and the hospital treatments for the people and prevail among them, um, peop uh, those people, Father, we pray, that they will know that you are with them in this time of difficulty. And there are so many other countries, Father, on top of all the troubles, they have wars and famines and uh, all sorts of troubles in their countries. We remember Burma, we remember Yemen, and there are so many other countries in this world. Father, we pray that you will 
speak in the hearts and minds of the leaders of those nations, that they will come to realize that they are there in that position to do the best for the well-being of their own people. Loving God, we pray for our church and our community, our wider church family. And pray, Father, that you will continue to keep us all together, giving us your grace, giving us the deepest understanding of your presence in our lives, that no matter what our situation or circumstances, that we will be guided and held by the knowledge and understanding that you are always with us. So loving God, we bring before your presence now all our thoughts, all our needs, all our prayers, everything that is there in our hearts and minds to you. In the name and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And now is our communion part. We stand for this, let us stand. We are the body of Christ. In our spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us therefore keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us turn around one another and express our peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you, gracious Father, our maker and sustainer. You created the heavens and the earth and formed us in your own image. Though we sinned against you, your love for us was constant and you sent your son Jesus Christ to be the saviour of the world. Sharing our human nature, he was born of Mary and baptised in the Jordan. He proclaimed your kingdom by word and deed and was put to death upon the cross. You raised him from the dead, you exalted him in glory. And through him, you have sent your Holy Spirit, calling us to be your people, a community of faith. And so with angels and archangels and all the choirs of heaven, we join in the triumphant hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, we praise you that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior Christ took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. 
remembering therefore his death and resurrection and proclaiming his eternal sacrifice, we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving as we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Send down your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Unite us with him forever and bring us with the whole creation to your eternal kingdom. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, The gifts of God for the people of God. May Jesus Christ be praised. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Now please be seated. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me shall not hunger, and those who believe in me shall never thirst. body of Christ keep us in eternal life amen The blood of Christ keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. We join in our final prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. Just before we join in our final hymn, To God Be the Glory, uh, just a little reminder that um, uh, we will have our extended communion service at four o'clock. Those who are not um, able to join us in person, um, the communion um, fellowship cups will be brought to you and um, we can have communion online at the extended communion at 4 p.m. Now we join in singing our final hymn.
blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace in the power of the Spirit to live and work God's praise and glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.